God, if the cause is permanently present from eternity and is sufficient for its effect, then why doesn't the effect also exist from eternity? How could the cause exist eternally, but the effect only come into being just a finite time ago? If the necessary and sufficient conditions for the effect are eternal, then why isn't the effect eternal as well? How can the cause exist without its effect? Well, it seems to me there's only one way out of this dilemma, and that is to say that the cause of the universe's coming into being is a personal agent who is endowed with freedom of the will and who can therefore bring about a spontaneous new effect without any sort of prior determining conditions. Philosophers call this kind of causation agent causation. And because the agent is free, he can initiate new effects um, which were not previously present. He can bring about new conditions. So a finite time ago, a creator endowed with freedom of the will could freely bring the universe into being at that moment. And in that way, the creator could exist changelessly and eternally, but create the world with a beginning in time. By exercising his causal power, he brings it about that a world with a beginning comes to exist. So the cause is eternal, but the effect is not. So in this way, and I think this way alone, it's possible to have an effect with a beginning arise from an eternal cause, namely through the free will of a personal creator. So this argument, if successful, leads to the existence of a personal creator of the universe who is uncaused, beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, and unimaginably powerful. Now, Dawkins does address this version of the cosmological argument. Remarkably, however, he doesn't dispute either premise of the argument. Instead, all he questions is the theological significance of the argument's conclusion. He writes, and I quote, even if we allow the dubious luxury of arbitrarily conjuring up a terminator to an infinite regress and giving it a name, there is absolutely no reason to endow that terminator with any of the properties normally ascribed to God. Omnipotence, omniscience, goodness, creativity of design, to say nothing of human attributes such as listening to prayers, forgiving sins, and reading innermost thoughts. Now, this is an amazingly concessionary statement. Dawkins doesn't dispute that the argument successfully proves the existence of an uncaused, beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, unimaginably powerful, personal creator of the universe. He merely complains that this personal creator hasn't also been shown to be omnipotent, omniscient, good, creative of design, listening to prayers, forgiving sins, and reading innermost thoughts. To which I say, so what? The argument wasn't designed to prove those sorts of things. In fact, it would be a bizarre form of atheism, in fact, an atheism not deserving the name, that believes that there is an uncaused, beginningless, changeless, immaterial, timeless, spaceless, unimaginably powerful, personal creator of the universe, who may, for all we know, also have all of the properties listed by Dawkins. Now, we don't have to call this personal creator of the universe God if Dawkins thinks that that's unhelpful. But nevertheless, the point remains that a being such as I have described, does exist as a result of this argument, and Dawkins never disputes the point. Second argument that I discussed was the moral argument for God's existence. It goes like this. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Two, objective moral values and duties do exist. Three, therefore, God exists. 
Now what makes this little argument so powerful is that it's not only logically ironclad, but also that people generally believe both of its premises. In fact, Dawkins himself appears to be committed to both of its premises. With respect to premise one, Dawkins informs us, and I quote, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. But although Dawkins says that there is no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference, the fact is that Dawkins is also a stubborn moralist. For example, he declares himself mortified that the Enron executive, Jeff Skilling, uh, regards Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, as his favorite book because uh, of its perceived social Darwinism. Dawkins calls compassion and generosity noble emotions. He denounces the doctrine of original sin as morally obnoxious. He vigorously condemns such actions as the harassment and abuse of homosexuals, the religious indoctrination of children, the Incan practice of human sacrifice, and prizing cultural diversity over the interests of Amish children. He even goes so far as to offer his own revised version of the Ten Commandments as a guide for moral behavior. All the while, marvelously oblivious to the contradiction with his own stated ethical subjectivism. So it is remarkable that Dawkins seems to be committed to both of the premises of the argument. Now, in his survey of arguments for God's existence, Dawkins touches on a sort of moral argument which he calls the argument from degree, but it bears little resemblance to the argument presented here. We're not arguing from degrees of goodness to some highest good. Rather, we're arguing from the objectivity of moral values and duties to their foundation in reality. And Dawkins himself does seem to believe in the existence of objective moral values and duties. It's hard to believe that all of Dawkins' heated moral denunciations and affirmations are really intended to be no more than his subjective opinion. As if to whisper in aside, I, I don't really think that uh, homosexual uh, discrimination or child abuse are wrong. It, it's just my opinion. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. There's no moral objectivity. The problem is, however, that the affirmation of objective moral values and duties is incompatible with his atheism. For on naturalism, we are just animals, and animals are not moral agents. So Dawkins affirms both of the premises of the moral argument, and therefore on pain of irrationality, he is committed to the argument's conclusion, namely that God exists. The teleological argument. Dawkins is 0 for 2 so far on the arguments for God's existence. Surely he's not going to strike out on the teleological argument, which is the famous argument for design. Well, sorry to disappoint, uh, but Dawkins' response to the most discussed form of the argument for design, namely the argument from the fine-tuning of the universe, uh, turns out to be very long-winded, but also very weak. Now, although advocates of the so-called intelligent design movement still appeal to examples of biological complexity as evidence of design, the real cutting edge of the contemporary discussion today concerns the remarkable fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Dawkins responds to this argument um, in chapter four of his book under the heading, The Anthropic Principle Cosmological Version. Now this is a simple formulation of the teleological argument based on fine tuning. Premise one, the fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, 
or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. Now, with respect to premise one, let me simply explain what's meant by fine-tuning. The expression does not mean designed. Otherwise, the argument would be obviously circular. Rather, during the last 40 years or so, scientists have discovered that the existence of intelligent life anywhere in the cosmos depends upon a complex and delicate balance of initial conditions which are simply given in the Big Bang themselves. And this is called the fine-tuning of the universe. Now, premise one simply lists the three possibilities for explaining 